welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. John Scalzi's Old Man's War is a very unique book. It's an emotional roller coaster filled with loss, love, lust, comedy, action, and death. This video is full of spoilers, so be warned. We start off with John Perry, a 75-year-old man as he joins the military. What military would want a 75-year-old man? Well, that is the question that drives the first part of this novel. The Colonial Defense Force, or CDF, recruits 75-year-olds from Earth, at which point they disappear, never to be seen on Earth again. The rumors are that they are somehow made to be of fighting ability again, but no one knows exactly how. As all the 75-year-olds, including Perry, travel on the transport ship, they begin to speculate, all while being fed decadent food. One of the recruits thinks that they will be given surgical implants to make them young again. New bones, new organs, upgraded joints. Another one thinks they may just be given powerful drugs to cover for the pain of their aging bodies, along with stimulants that will bring them back up to their adolescent abilities. No one knows for sure, but they all signed up, hoping that somehow they would extend their lives. But as readers, we can't help but think it might all be a trick. Maybe it's a way to control all the population numbers, or maybe they're being fed to an alien race. The fatty foods they keep mentioning that they are fed at every meal bring up thoughts of Hansel and Gretel. Finally, we find out. The transfer, I said? That's right, Dr. Russell said. Do you mind if I ask you what the hell you're talking about, I said? Dr. Russell smiled. Mr. Perry, when you signed up to join the army, you thought we'd make you young again, right? Yes, I said, everyone does. You can't fight a war with old people, yet you recruit them. You have to have some way to make them young again. How do you think we do it? Dr. Russell asked. I don't know, I said. Gene therapy? Cloned replacement parts? You'd swap out old parts somehow and put in new ones? You're half right, Dr. Russell said. We do use gene therapy and cloned replacements, but we don't swap out anything except you. I don't understand, I said. I felt very cold, like reality was being tugged out from under my feet. Your body is old, Mr. Perry. It's old and it won't work for much longer. There's no point in trying to save it or upgrade it. It's not something that gains value when it ages, or has replaceable parts that keep it running like new. All a human body does when it gets older is get old. So we're going to get rid of it. We're getting rid of it all. The only part of you that we're going to save is the only part of you that hasn't decayed. Your mind, your consciousness, your sense of self. Dr. Russell walked over to the far door where the colonists had exited and rapped on it. Then he turned back to me. Take a good look at your body, Mr. Perry, he said, because you're about to say goodbye to it. You're going somewhere else. Where am I going, Dr. Russell? I asked. I could barely make enough spit to talk. You're going here, he said, and opened the door. From the other side, the colonials came back in. One of them was pushing a wheelchair with someone in it. I craned my head to take a look, and I began to shake. It was me, 50 years ago. But it wasn't exactly John Perry. The new bodies they are given are highly altered, to be better than a human body in every way. Stronger, faster, more durable. From the outside, they looked like green versions of their younger selves, with cat eyes and nanobots for blood. Even the slowest new recruit could outrun an Olympic gold medalist in their new body, as well as hold their breath the entire time they were doing it. And if they were damaged, they could heal in hours instead of days, days instead of being crippled for life, and they could survive what would kill any normal human. These bodies are not just better functioning, however, they are better looking. And soon the ship became a single screws. If everyone on that single's cruise was a supermodel. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but as the pleasure cruise neared its destination, the party ended, and reality slapped them in the face. They were informed that they were lied to their entire lives back on Earth. The galaxy is not the peaceful playground they were all led to believe. The human race and the few worlds they had colonized 
are completely surrounded on every side by hostile races. To quote another novel, the universe was a dark forest, with a hunter hiding behind every tree. Aliens of every type imaginable want to kill humans and take their planet for themselves, many of which have a taste for human flesh. These other species have all types of strange and unknown technologies, and most are far faster and more agile than humans. Three quarters of the CDF recruits die before their tour of service is over. Well, Christ on a popsicle stick! Master Sergeant Antonio Ruz declared after he glared at the 60 of us in his recruit platoon, standing, we hoped, more or less at attention on the tarmac of Delta Base's shuttle port. We have clearly just lost the battle for the goddamn universe. I look at you people and the words tremendously fucked leap right out of my goddamn skull. If you are the best that the Earth has to offer, it's time we bend over and get a tentacle right up the ass. This got an involuntary chuckle from several recruits. Master Sergeant Antonio Ruz could have come from Central Casting. He was exactly what you would expect from a drill instructor. Large, angry, and colorfully abusive right from the get-go. No doubts in the next few seconds, he would get into one of the amused recruits' faces, hurl obscenities, and demand 100 push-ups. This is what you get from watching 75 years worth of war dramas. Ha ha ha! Master Sergeant Antonio Ruz said back at us. Don't think I don't know what you're thinking, you dumb shits. I know you're enjoying my performance at the moment. How delightful. I'm just like all those drill instructors you've seen in the movies. Aren't I just the fucking quaint one? The amused chuckles had come to a stop. That last bit was not in the script. You don't understand, Master Sergeant Antonio Ruz said. You're under the impression that I'm talking like this because this is something drill instructors are supposed to do. You're under the impression that after a few weeks of training, my gruff but fair facade will begin to slip and I will show some inkling of being impressed with a lot of you. And that at the end of your training, you'll have earned my grudging respect. You're under the impression I'll think fondly of you while you're off making the universe safe for humanity, secure in the knowledge I've made you better fighting men and women. Your impression, ladies and gentlemen, is completely and irrevocably fucked! Master Sergeant Antonio Ruse stepped forward and paced down the line. Your impression is fucked because unlike you, I actually have been out in the universe. I have seen what we're up against. I have seen men and women that I knew personally turned into hot fucking chunks of meat that could still manage to scream. On my first tour of duty, my commanding officer was turned into a goddamn alien lunch buffet. I watched as the fuckers grabbed him, pinned him to the ground, sliced out his internal organs, passed them out and gobbled him down, and slid back under the earth before any of us could do a goddamn thing. A stifled giggle from somewhere behind me. Master Sergeant Antonio Roos stopped and cocked his head. Oh? One of you thinks I'm kidding! One of you dumb motherfuckers always does. That's why I keep this around. Activate now, he said, and suddenly in front of each of us a video screen appeared. It took me a disorienting second before I realized Ruse had somehow managed to activate my brain pal remotely, switching on a video feed. The feed appeared to be taken from a small helmet cam. We saw several soldiers hunkered down in a foxhole, discussing plans for the next day's travel. Then one of the soldiers stopped talking for a second, slammed a palm down onto the dirt. He glared up fearfully and yelled, INCOMING! A split second before the ground erupted beneath him. What happened next happened so quickly that not even the instinctive panic turns of the camera's owner was fast enough to miss it all. It was not pleasant. In the real world, someone was vomiting, ironically matching the actions of the camera owners. Blessedly, the video feed switched off right after that. I'm not so funny now, am I? Master Sergeant Antonio Ruz said mockingly. I'm not that happy fucking stereotypical drill instructor anymore, am I? You're not in the military comedy anymore, are you? Welcome to the fucking universe. The universe is a fucked up place, my friends. And I'm not talking to you like this because I'm putting on some amusing little drill instructor routine. The man who was sliced and diced was among the best fighting men I have ever had the privilege of knowing. None of you are his equal. And yet you see what happened to him... Think what will happen to you. I'm talking to you like this because I sincerely believe, from the bottom of my heart, that if you're the best humanity has to offer, we are magnificently and totally fucked. Do you believe me? True to their word, their commander sent them out to battle after battle, and the men dropped like flies. None of them were prepared for this reality. 
None of them could adapt to every alien tactic they came up against, and those that survived were not the best fighters, or the smartest among them, but the luckiest. Dumb luck was the only reason any of them survived. This leads to the funniest mental breakdown in literature. Conquering the universe was beginning to get to me. The unsettling feeling had begun at Jindal, where we ambushed Jindalian soldiers as they returned to their Ares, slashing their huge wings with beams, and rockets that sent them tumbling and screeching down sheer 2,000 meter cliff faces. It had really started to affect me above Udaspri, as we donned inertia dampening power packs to provide better control as we leapt from rock fragment to rock fragment in Udaspri's rings, playing hide and seek with the spider like Vindi, who had taken to hurling bits of the ring down to the planet below plotting delicately decaying orbits that aimed the falling debris directly on top of the human colony of Halford. By the time we arrived at Cova Banda, I was ready to snap. It might have been because of the Covandu themselves, who in many respects were clones to the human race itself, bipedal, mammalian, extraordinarily gifted in artistic matters, particularly poetry and drama, fast breeding, and unusually aggressive when it came to the universe and their place in it. Humans in the Kovandu frequently found themselves fighting for the same undeveloped real estate. Kova Banda, in fact, had been a human colony before it had been a Kovandu one. Abandoned after a native virus had caused the settlers to grow unsightly additional limbs and homicidal additional personalities. The virus didn't give the Kovandu even a headache. They moved right in. 63 years later, the colonials finally developed a vaccine and wanted the planet back. Unfortunately, the Kovandu again, all too much like humans, weren't very much into the whole sharing thing. So in we went, to do battle against the Kovandu, the tallest of whom is no more than one inch tall. The Kovandu are not so stupid as to launch their tiny armies against humans 60 or 70 times their size. Of course, first they hit us with aircraft, long-range mortars, tanks, and other military weapons that might actually do some damage. And did. It's not easy to take out 20 centimeter long aircraft flying at several hundred clicks an hour, but you do what you can to make it difficult to use these options. We did this by landing in Kova Bandu's main city park so any artillery that missed us hit their own people. And anyway, eventually you dispose of most of these annoyances. Our people used more care destroying Kovandu forces than they typically might, not only because they're smaller and require more attention to hit, there's also the matter that no one wants to have been killed by a one inch opponent. Eventually, however, you shoot down all the aircraft and take out all the tanks, and then you have to deal with the individual Kovandu themselves. So here's how you fight one. You step on him. You just bring your foot down, apply pressure, and it's done. As you're doing this, the Kovandu is firing his weapon at you and screaming at the top of his tiny little lungs, a squeak that you may just be able to hear, but it's useless. Your suit, designed to apply brakes on human-scale high-powered projectiles, barely register the bits of matter flung at your toes by a Kovandu. You barely register the crunch of the little being you've stomped. You spot another one, you do it again. We did this for hours as we waded through Kova Banda's main city, stopping every now and then to sight a rocket on a skyscraper five or six meters high and take it down with a single shot. Some of our platoon would spray a shotgun blast into a building instead, letting the individual shot, each big enough to take a Kovandu's head clean off, rattle through the building like mad pachinko balls. But mostly it was about the stomping. Godzilla, the famous Japanese monster, who had been undergoing his umpteenth revival as I left the earth, would have felt right at home. I don't remember exactly when it was that I began to cry and kick skyscrapers, but I had done it long enough and hard enough that when Alan was finally called over to retrieve me, asshole was informing me that I had managed to break three toes. Alan walked me back to the city park we landed in, and had me sit down. As soon as I did, some Kovandu emerged from behind a boulder and aimed his weapon at my face. It felt like tiny grains of sand were plunking into my cheek. God damn it, I said. I grabbed the Kovandu like a ball bearing and angrily flung him into a nearby skyscraper. He zoomed off, spinning in a flat arc, decelerated with a tiny thunk when he hit the building and fell the two remaining meters to the ground. Any other Kovandu in the area apparently decided against assassination attempts. I turned to Alan. Don't you have a squad to pay attention to? I asked. He'd been promoted after his squad leader had his face torn off by an angry Jindalian. I could ask you the same question, he said, and then shrugged. They're fine. They have their orders and there's no real opposition anymore. It's clean and sweet. 
and Tipton can handle the squad for that. Keys told me to come hose you down and find out what the hell is wrong with you. So what the hell is wrong with you? Christ, Ellen, I said. I've just spent three hours stepping on intelligent beings like they were fucking bugs. That's what's wrong with me. I'm stomping people to death with my fucking feet. This, I swept an arm out. It's just totally fucking ridiculous, Alan. These people are one inch tall. It's like Gulliver beating the shit out of the Lilliputians. We don't get to choose our battles, John, Alan said. How does this battle make you feel, I asked. It bothers me a little, Alan said. It's not a stand-up fight at all. We're just blowing these people to hell. On the other hand, the worst casualty I have in my squad is a burst eardrum. That's a miracle for you right there. So overall, I feel pretty good about it. And the Kovandu aren't entirely helpless. The overall scoreboard between us and them is pretty much tied. This was surprisingly true. The Kovandu's size work to their advantage in space battles. Their ships are hard for ours to track, and their tiny fighter craft do little damage individually, but an immense amount in aggregate. It was only when it came to the ground battles that we had the overwhelming advantage. Kova Banda had a relatively small space fleet protecting it. It was one of the reasons the CDF decided to try and take it back. Okay, so it's dark humor, but I can't help but picture this through the eyes of a Kovandu hiding amongst the rubble. This giant is ruthlessly squashing your friends and relatives until it just starts going insane and starts crying and throwing a tantrum before another giant comes over, clearly concerned, and sets the first giant down in the middle of the rubble that was once your city and gives him a pep talk. Am, am I the only one that finds this funny? I, I am. And, and I should get help. But it's just a book, I mean, that doesn't make it better, huh? Okay, well, I'll just delete that part, then. I'll just edit it out. <laughs> of all the species Perry runs into, the most interesting was the Khonsu. Large, insect-like monsters with tech far more advanced than any other species we met. But war is their religion, and they always face their enemies with comparable levels of weaponry to give their enemies a chance. They believe themselves to be the highest form of life, because they possess the most destructive power. So because of their religion, they will try to help other species by both warring with them and by setting them against each other, like they did when they gave the Ray a device to detect CDF ships before they even jump to a location, causing both civilizations to upgrade their tech and understanding of physics. The Ray invading the human colony planet Coral is the climax of this novel. It's also the point where Perry meets his dead wife's living green body. You see, John's wife died after enlisting, but before reporting for duty. Her green warrior's body had already been grown, and the CDF doesn't just throw those bodies away. They are given a generic personality and trained to be battle-ready anyway as part of the Ghost Brigades. And it just so happened that Perry was rescued from Coral by his dead wife's body. The conclusion to this story now sees Perry and his wife's body, now named Jane Sagan, returning to Coral to not just reclaim it for humanity, but also to steal the Consu's ship detection device for study. During the battle, Jane is almost killed, but Perry saves her, and the final lines leave us to believe that if they can both survive the rest of their tours of duty, they may just reunite as man and wife again. Okay, so here's a little side note to think about. John Perry is 76 years old. His wife's body is only uh, four, I believe, or maybe it was six. But um, yeah, I think it was six. So he's literally 70 years older than this girl, but they kind of make it, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure what I feel about this because they kind of try to make it, or I should say John Scalzi tries to make it so that Jane Sagan is like the continuation of John Perry's wife. And she just kind of, its all, it, they try to make it more like she's a woman with amnesia, doesn't remember the part of her life she lived with Perry. But I mean, uh, yeah, they act like adults, but they're, most of them are, they're, well, they're all under 10 for the most part, all of the, the ghost brigades that he runs into. So it's a little bit weird. You can either look at it like a 76 year old with a six year old, or you can look at it as two people in 20 year old bodies, or you could look at it as um, uh, two 76 year olds with, uh, but one has, um, uh, not Alzheimer's, <laughs> one, ha uh, one has, um, why can't I think of the word I'm looking for? Uh, they've lost their memory. 
They have amnesia. There we go. They have amnesia. So I'll let you decide on what what you think about that. <laughs> well, if you're still around, I really appreciate it. I thank you for staying. And uh, if you enjoyed that, please give me a like, comment, subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you back here for the next one.